Well, tonight, guys, we've got something so, so special for you. I know tonight's normally Pastor Donna's night. And she decided to, to step to the side and let this thing happen. And so, so Pastor Paul, you got to bring it because I'm telling you, she normally does it. So. <laughs> but I've got something really, really special for you guys tonight. Um, he's a great, great, great friend of mine. Um, he's, he's been my friend for the past like five, six years. And we've been able to see each other through different areas of life doing ministry. And um, he is the director of Crossroads Leadership College. Um, it is a four-year college now where it actually used to be a two-year program. It is now a four-year accredited college where uh, they get a degree and get all the training for ministry and all. And uh, honestly, our children's pastors, Pastor Tyler and Pastor Paul, both went through this program when they were in college. So they are a product of what, what is happening at this school. And uh, back at my old youth group, I was able to send a few students through there, which are now in ministry as well. And uh, it's just an awesome, awesome, awesome school. And he's here not to just talk about the school, but he's here to preach the word of God. And uh, that's one thing the man knows. He knows the word of God, and he's here to give you something that God laid on his heart. So we're going to pray, and he's going to come up, and he's going to be the next voice that you hear. So God, we come before you right now, and we thank you for this moment. We thank you for this time to where we can come together, youth, uh, youth, young adults, older, and all. God, we get to come in this room together and worship you and lift you up and hear the words straight from your heart. So God, we ask that you do what only you can do have your way in this place speak to our hearts speak to our situations speak to our minds and God just do what only you can do in Jesus mighty powerful name everybody shout amen amen amen, amen. amen, amen, amen. well I'm not going to fill the shoes of Pastor Donna I'm going to do my best but I will not say that I'm going to walk inside of that because man it is an honor to be here Pastor Donna and Pastor Daryl thank y'all so much for giving me the opportunity in CLC to be here. And so I want to do one thing before I jump into the word and what I'm going to preach. I asked, um, I have eight of my students here. They're all in this school going, hey, I, I have a calling on my life. I want to be a pastor. I want to, I want to be the next generation that brings things forward. And so if any of my CLC students, I told them, I said, hey, ministry happen, doesn't happen on a stage. It happens in the crowd. It happens. And so they're all intermingled. So I'm going to have them stand. There's eight of them here. If you guys, wherever you guys are at, you can stand all right there. And then I'm going to have Macy come join me on stage. Yeah, Macy can come up here. Because I wanted you all to hear from one of my students. And so Macy um, is a freshman student. Uh, she grew up right there in Lafayette, Louisiana. Uh, real Crowley area. And so she, um, I asked her, I said, hey, would you, and I'll put her on the spot. So uh, y'all be kind to her because I put her on the spot. And I said, hey, you're going to speak to them. But I wanted her to share her testimony uh, because she has a pretty powerful testimony. And, um, you know, what I'm even speaking on, our testimony matters, right? Like what we share, who, what we declare and let people know, hey, God is transform me. He's made me new. And so I asked Macy if she'll do that before I get started. 22 years old, um, started going to Crossroads about three, four years ago. My mom's boyfriend started attending, so he started bringing us. And before, I had never gone to church, came from a Catholic background. They never really went. Um, and I soon started to, like, feel the tug of God. I really started to feel him pulling me closer and closer. And it was kind of scary because I realized that I was going to have to face a lot of things that I had suppressed my whole life. So I kind of... Didn't get too deep into it. Well, then I started to pray about it, and I was like, you know, I really want to get closer. I want to do more. Well, then I started, well, I prayed for a job that would allow me to go every Sunday. Got two jobs. Was able to go every single Sunday. So, started attending, and then it kind of just quickly took off. Um, amen. Um, so, let's see, let's see, let's see. So, yeah, I was nervous about facing a lot of the stuff that I had suppressed. So I just started to get really real about it and let God take over. Um, I came from a very dysfunctional family and background. Um, every type of abuse that there is, we kind of dealt with, uh, physical, mental, emotional, sexual. Um, 
And I had a lot of that suppressed. And I just never, I never talked about it. I never told anybody. And the kind of parents that I had, <clears throat> it was so unpredictable what it would be like and what reaction I would get, so I just never spoke. And that just caused me to become very, very numb and depressed and just full of anxiety a lot. And I just never, never knew how to cope with it. And I remember whenever I was like 21, I remember for the first time I was sitting in my car and I felt like the, the presence of God, the love of God for the first time in my life. And I, that was the moment that I realized, like, I was never going to get this from a parent. I was never going to get this type of love yeah. from, from a boyfriend, from drugs. Like, I was never going to get it. So, um, so I just realized I was never going to get that anywhere. So I started craving it more and more and more. So then that's whenever I made the decision to apply to Crossroads College. Had no idea what it was, did not know what it was about, but I knew that God was there, so it had to be better than the life that I was living. So, and uh, that's how I'm here. Pastor Paul Absolutely. Paul. Y'all give it up for Macy. Thank you so much, Macy. Yeah, Macy. It's, it's amazing to me watching young men, young women decide... God, enough is enough. I'm done being defeated. I'm done feeling like I'm not worthy enough. I'm done feeling like I can't accomplish something. And so I look at this generation right over here. Man, this excites me. Uh, Pastor Armand, Pastor Lauren, thank you for making this happen because I want this generation to know God sees exactly where you're at. You see, Pastor Tim was up here and he said, anxiety has to flee in the name of Jesus. And it does. It has to leave you. And it can't stay with you. Fear can't stay with you. God wants to transform the very being of who you are. He wants you to understand that his identity is the right identity. And so I, I get excited whenever I get to travel and do things with these students because they, they, they bring something out of me, right? Like, I'm not saying I'm the old man because I'm only 34 and I'm going to introduce my family to you. But the reality is as I'm traveling with them, man, it's a cool because like, we're at the hotel. I'll share this little story. We're at the hotel, right? Like, um, we're walking out to come preach, and this, this girl starts waving at us, and I'm like, how do I know her? Do I know her? Because I know a lot of people here because of just the history of coming to this church. And so they're waving at us, and I'm like, hi. And, I'm, you know, you do the pastoral thing. Like, hi, I don't, she looks like she knows me. And I look back, and I'm like, who is she, guys? Like, do you all know her? Thankfully, they knew her, right? They were like, yeah, we were actually down eating breakfast at the hotel. She asked if we knew God. We started talking. She put us on her little video. We started praising and talking about who God is and what God's doing. And then the cook was saying that. And I went, okay, that's what it's about. It's about Jesus and making Jesus the big deal, right? So I want to speak to you guys tonight about something that's very dear on my heart. Before I do that, I'll introduce my family. They have a picture. I don't know if they can get it up or not, but this is my family. Um, I'll start over here. That's my lovely bride, Michelle. And so she's the reason why I do what I do. And she empowers me. She's my biggest encourager. She pushes me forward. She, she also works at the school with me. We direct together. She gets to really pour into these students because, hey, healthy marriages are important, right? And so I want to make sure that they see a healthy marriage. And so we prioritize each other. The oldest is right down here. His name is Isaiah. He's got a little thumbs up. He's, he's uh, tenderhearted. Um, believe what you pray for your kids will happen, Right? When I, me and Michelle started praying, I prayed, God, give me somebody who has a heart for people that's tender hearted. And actually, I was kind of praying, like, God, nothing like me, not the competitiveness in me, not the, you know, so like, it's weird when you start praying and you're like, just make them not like me, Lord. But he made a copy paste and made a kid look just like me, right? And so the reality was, is I want him to be tender hearted. That's what he is. I find myself on a soccer field holding his hand because he's like, if they'll just ask me for the ball, I'll pass it to him. I'm like, thank you, God, for instilling that inside of him. And then that little girl, that's what the picture you're going to get, right? Her name is Nessa. And that's who she is. She's lively. I really think she might be an Olympian one day because she's not scared of nothing. i like, she scares daddy, right? Like, please don't jump off the bunk bed. Don't do those kind of things. But she does. She has no fear. I'm like, okay, I just hope that, you know, like this all works out because I don't, I don't know exactly what I'm doing. I'm on number three, right? And the number three up here is Judah. He just turned one yesterday as we were traveling here. He's, he's a, you know, I, I, I pray harder for him because I don't know what happens. I don't know. Maybe I'm telling on myself, but as a parent, like when the third kid, I'm like sprinkling the food on the floor. I'm like, here you go. <laughs> I'm like telling on myself, right? Like, but I'm like, I'm like, you're going to survive. Like there's tons of, there's tons of toys here. It's sad because you get to the first birthday. You're like, uh, 
hey, here's your brother's toy. It's great, huh? It's shiny. Like, I don't want more toys in my house. I have enough, right? So, so that's my family. They're amazing. Um, I had to take my little boy. This is how tenderhearted he is. Um, I got on the road a little bit later. I was trying to get here before the E3 because I would have loved to have been here just to see it and everything. But my little boy, I knew that I had to spend some time with them before I left. And so I took him to breakfast that morning before I dropped off to school. And I said, Bubba, I said, Daddy's leaving. And he has a hard time whenever Daddy leaves. And, I, and he goes, Dad, you really are leaving? Do you have to? And I said, yeah, I do. And he goes, why, Dad? I said, because people need to hear about Jesus. And I just, I begin to, but I, and then I asked him, hey, will you pray for me? And man, that little kid prayed for me. And he was like, and, and he just did it with the most tender heart, right? And, and it helped him realize, hey, dad's going to do something that's impactful. He's going to preach Jesus. And so, so yeah, so that's my family. Let's get into the message because I believe God really did give me a word to speak with you guys and to speak preach, um, hopefully all throughout this nation, as things start opening up, I'm going to go and I'm going to speak this. And so, um, how many of you guys have ever taken a risk, right? Like, I'm a risk taker. I, I like risk, except for if it's heights. If it's heights, I'm like, no, thank you. <laughs> like, I don't know what it is. I'm, I don't know if it's because when you're a tall person, like, heights scare you. I don't know if that's a thing with all tall people, but usually when I meet tall people, they're like, yeah, I don't know, I'm not for heights. And so risk, risk is like one of those things. Well, my little kids uh, showed me a little illustration on risk as I was um, just trying to think through what it looked like to be a risk taker, right? And so my little girl, like I said, Nessa, she goes from the back of the house, she's, she goes and, daddy! And I'm like, yeah, Nessa, come see! And when she says that, I'm like, oh no, she wrote on all the walls, this is about not going to be good. So she's like, come see, she's ready for me to come. I walk in there and she's like on her, like the edge right here, standing on the top bunk. And she's like hanging on like this. And I look at her, I go, don't you do it. And she looks at me, she goes, it's okay, daddy. And jumps into a basket full of stuffed animals. So then my little, my little boy's like, I can do that. And I, I know Isaiah's not gonna do this. So, okay, this is not parenting. You know, I'm not parenting right at this point. I, and I'm like, okay, go ahead and do it. So he goes out there, he stands on it and he goes, oh no. And, you know, several times, Nessa comes and says, get off the way, and jumps again. I'm like, oh, man, this is not going to end well. Like, my wife's teaching dance right now. I'm going to be calling her going, hey, we're on our way to the hospital. I was like, how do I put it into this? But my little boy was like, no, Dad, I really want to do it. I can really do it. And so Nessa starts, like, pushing him and keeps jumping past him. And I think he saw her do it enough times that he was like, oh, I'm doing this. And he goes, okay, Dad, can you move the basket a little bit closer? Like, put it closer to the bed. I was like, absolutely, son, move it closer to the bed. And sure enough, not really jumping, just falling, he fell into the basket. He didn't get hurt. He got up. He's cheering. I'm cheering. I'm like, okay, no more, right? But, but I s tell you that story because there's always two sides of the, some, that's a risk, right? The risk for Nessa, she was like, hey, I can just do this. I got this. But for her, but for Isaiah, it might have cost a little bit more because he's probably got like 50 pounds on her, right? Like in his mind, he's going, this is going to hurt more than my little sister, right? And so the risk was there. But you know what I've realized through that when there's a weight with the risk? Every time I've stepped into what God had for me, the risk was worth it. So I want to preach a message that's called, it's worth the risk. You see, risk is simply what I'm saying is God's looking for followers, not just fans. I'm a sports guy, and I'm going to congratulate you guys because uh, Pastor Armand, I called him as soon as Georgia won. I said, congratulations, because I got two favorite teams. I have the LSU Tigers, and then I have anyone that plays Alabama. And so I told him, I said, if I, if, if I was willing to spend the money, I'd probably be wearing Georgia colors. I'd probably be doing that, right? But the reality was, so we stopped. I told him, I texted him. I said, hey, man, I'm stopping in Montgomery to eat just so I can get out and bark. That's all I'm doing, right? Like, and, <laughs> and that's what we did. We got out lunch and we, we ate in Montgomery. I just wanted to remind them they're not the national champions, right? And so, because for some reason, they're going to say some excuse, right? So, um, but I'm a, I'm a big sports guy. So I love sports. And so when I think about sports, it really gets me going. And I'm like, okay, and God, God just told me, he said, Paul, don't let sports be the thing that you're so passionate about and you understand what it means to be involved in sports and understand sports. I like to play sports, all that kind of stuff. He goes, but when it comes to me, don't be just a follower. I mean, don't just be a fan. I'm asking you to be a follower. He wants us on the field, right? And so Jesus is commanding us to not only be a disciple, but also be a disciple maker. That's, that's a mandate for every single person. And so I'm gonna bring you to one of my favorite passages of scripture, it's Matthew 28. 
right? And so in Matthew 28, uh, verse 16, and if you got your Bibles, this is a good place to bring your Bibles, right? Like, or you can turn them on, it's okay. Um, but the reality is, is this is a great place for you to, hey, I'm gonna bring my Bible, I'm gonna highlight things, I'm gonna write things down, I'm gonna use, use this word that God's given me to be impactful in my community. And so in Matthew 28, it's called the Great Commission, right? And so uh, it says, but the 11 disciples proceeded to Galilee to the mountain which Jesus has designated. When they saw him, they worshiped him, but some were doubtful. And Jesus came up and spoke to them, saying, all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. So we see this passage that is a mandate it's not a suggestion, right? Sometimes we do look at it as a suggestion. There's times where we don't realize what is being said here, but it becomes a mandate. And so for a Christian, we belong to another kingdom, right? So we're, we belong to the kingdom of Christ. And so if we're part of that kingdom, what we have to understand is biblical discipleship is the cultivation of kingdom people. See, it's the process of of the body of believers to bring Christians from spiritual infancy to spiritual maturity so that they are able to replicate the process in others, right? And so God never expected us to continue to stay in spiritual infancy. But if I'm being honest, how do we stay in spiritual infancy is we go, I just come to a service and that's it. We never make this become real to us, right? And so, so the reality was that I began to understand is the goal for God is to have men and women who have been developed over time into proper res- representation, representatives of the kingdom of which they are part. So he wants us to. So, so what Jesus does, he goes, hey, then the 40 days that I'm here before the resurrection, right, and before the ascension, what he did is he said, I'm going to call a meeting because this meeting is important. I want, you, I want my people there at this meeting. I want these 12 disciples there at this meeting. And then there's others. And so, so he calls this meeting. He had several meetings during this time, but he had one recorded meeting. It said it right there in Matthew 26, 16. It says this, but the 11 disciples proceeded to Galilee to the mountain, which Jesus had designated, which Jesus had said that he would be at. And so it was a defined designated meeting in Galilee. The site of the mountain to meet the risen Lord, it said the 11 had met him there. And then if, in 1 Corinthians 15, 6, it says this, he appeared to more than 500 brethren at one time, most of them who remain until now. And so I, I like math, and so I know there's 11, and then I know there's 489, right? There's 500 there. And then there's one more thing that I, that I, I had a moment when I caught it. And it says, and lo, in Matthew 28, 20 that I read to you, and lo, I will be with you always even to the end of the age. I don't know about you, but the age hasn't ended, right? And if there's a meeting where I'm invited to, I want to be there, especially if Jesus is the communicator, especially if he's the speaker, right? Like, I can't ask for a better meeting to be at. So I'm going to prioritize to be at that meeting. And so I want to talk about what that meeting looked like and what Jesus was saying to his people, right? And so, um, so Jesus calls this meeting as a risen Lord. And then, look, it says they gathered there and they worshiped. And it goes on to say that they saw the risen Christ. And I think it's important because you read this little context of the Great Commission, and it says they gathered there and they worship, but then they begin to doubt. And I'm like, oh, there's me. <laughs> like, why? You know, like, especially in my early years, I was like, okay, well, that was in there. So therefore, you know, that person that's like, well, I'm just, I always doubt, or I have these insecurities, or is it really going to happen? Or, or is this, I, I believe it makes it even more relatable. Oh, yeah, then they doubted, right? And in the midst of that, there's that tagline, right? It says they came, they worshiped, they celebrated the risen Christ, and they had question marks even. Through, even though some were doubtful, they sang songs, they prayed their prayers. It came time for the sermon. Jesus Christ stands up. He's preaching today. You see, I love that because it's like, no, no, there's nobody else that's going to preach. I'm preaching. And he comes and he stands before them and goes, I'm not just preaching But I'm preaching with the notion of I have all authority on heaven and earth has been given to me. And so I want you to know what I can do whenever I, whenever you understand what it looks like when I live inside of you. Because now there's going to be 
a whole different wave that's going to come. I have a mandate that I need you to carry out because now I'm gonna go with you, but I'm no longer the person doing it. I trained you, I, I walked with these 11. And so he's saying all authority, not some, not many, but all authority has been handed to me. There and down here in heaven, right? Heaven and earth. And so therefore Jesus says, go and make disciples. Baptizing in the name of, their, name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And so he says, I want you to make disciples. There's that mandate, right? I, be careful how you read God's word because, man, we need to read it. And if it says win or if it says make or it says do, right? Like, I'm like, all right, that's, I'm, I'm highlighting just that one little word if I need to to remind myself that this is the something God wants us to do. He wants us to step into this mandate. He wants us to understand what it means for us to make disciples. And so he says, go and make disciples. So it's not a suggestion, it's a commandment. But here's what I love about Jesus, because I don't know, you know, I, I always get to this place where I'm like, all right, God, you have, a, you have something you're telling me to do. It's right here in your word. But I, I'm like, okay, give me the X's and O's. How does it happen? What's the ultimate plan? And you know what I love about Jesus? Most of the time, if we'll get alone with God or we'll continue to read on, you'll see exactly how God wants you to do it. You know, he gives us this instruction and he really wants us to uh, not feel lost, but instead he wants us to feel empowered and that we can walk into something with victory, right? And so, so he goes, I'm going to give you this using three participles, Bat go, baptize, and teach, right? So you have this um, imperative, which is make disciples, and then you have three part of participles, go, baptize, and teach, and so in the midst of this, he's saying, hey, I, I want you to do this. But the problem is, is I'll go into it and I'm going to break those down for you, each one. But the reality is we got to know what a disciple is, right? What's a disciple? Because I don't know, I didn't grow up in church. The, I grew up as a 17-year-old boy. I grew up actually in California. It's crazy that I moved all the way to Louisiana. And as I, I didn't grow up in church. So when someone said disciple, I was like, disciple? Like, what is that? Like, you know, and so... I'm not going to act like everyone in here knows exactly what a disciple is. So let's talk about that. So a disciple, um, the Greek text is pronounced methetis, and I usually get that wrong, but it's because I don't speak Greek. Um, but that was a very well-known word in the Greek. When you said that word, when it came off of somebody's lips, it was, it was meant, um, the word meant it was somebody who was following in the footsteps of somebody else. You see, it wasn't just, when you said that, it's like, hey, that individual gets it. He's following in the footsteps of somebody else. And so, for example, in Matthew 10, we read verses where Jesus says in verse 24, a disciple is not above his master. It is enough for the disciple to become like his teacher. So a disciple is someone who becomes like somebody else, or as he said, like his teacher. So what am I saying? What's the goal here? The goal is this. The goal of, this, of a disciple is to become like Jesus Christ in our character and conduct. And I, man, I stop every time. Lord, I'm walking into this situation. God, I need your character and conduct. Help me be a disciple of Christ and represent you well. I don't want to just get up there. I don't want it to be Paul's words. God, I don't want to just... Um, I guess, lash out or have this notion, God, no, I want your character and conduct and yours are patience and yours is kind and yours has so much for me. And so in character and conduct and the other one is attitude and actions, right? God, let my attitude, let my actions represent you well because that matters to you. That's what discipleship is. And I'm, I'm gonna say I'm a disciple of Jesus Christ Then I wanna walk in character and conduct and attitude and actions that, are, that God puts inside of me, right? And so we progress, we begin to, and so what does that look like? We begin to think like Jesus thinks, right? When, when, if he was thinking right there with you, I tell that to my students all the time. I was like, hey, if you'll stop and go, okay, Jesus is here with me. Let me think. You'll probably think the right thing, right? Like the reality is, is you want to act like he would act if he was right here acting with you. And you would, you need to be what you, what he would be if he was being there right now. He was with you here right now because the reality is he is here with you, right? And so it's becoming a replica of another. But you and I live in a world dominated by Satan. We live in this world that just, that Satan dominates and he does different things. And, and so I always have that approach and I'm like, okay, so what does that look like? So what, what God wants us to do is train men and women like you in thinking of Jesus Christ. You see, if we'll stop in a world that's dominated by Satan and go, okay, 
No, greater is he that is in me than he that's in this world, right? No weapon formed against me shall prosper. Okay, let me remind Satan about who's inside of me and who the ability that I have to change a generation, to make things happen. And that's what excites me. That's what I have to stop and go, okay, now I'm thinking like Jesus is thinking. I'm acting like Jesus is acting because I'm going to operate in the way that Jesus tells me to operate. So that the culture dominated by Satan has to deal with the influence of people that have been consumed by their teacher having become disciples of Jesus Christ. Amen. I want to be consumed by Christ. So Jesus says he wants you to make disciples. Why? Here's why. So we can share his authority. So he can share his authority with you. You see, Jesus only shares his authority with up-close disciples, not mere, Christi- not mere Christians that just come maybe on a Sunday, right? Like for, for Jesus, he's going, you want my authority? Well, then I want you to draw nigh to me and I'll draw nigh to you. You want my authority? You want to understand how to operate and what I've given you and what I have for you? Then please don't just say, just don't think that you're just going to be able to just scoop by here and say, oh, I'm a Christian and not actually walk out what God's calling you to do, to be people of the way, right? And so, so God's saying, hey, I have more for you. I, I want to give you this authority, but I'm not just going to give it to anyone. I want to give it to ones that see the, the, the need to draw up close to me. You see, you can live all your life and never see the rule of God in your life. You can live all your Christian life and never see God overrule for your life. Because we have to... We have to submit ourselves to Christ. You see, God, God wants us to give it to him freely. He wants us to come to him and go, God, here's my goals and my dreams, and here's also all the sin and everything that I struggle with. He doesn't just want you to come with the struggles and go, hey, this is for me, God. No, God's going, hey, here's this, and here's this. God, you do with what you want, and I'll step into it, and I'll walk with it, and I'll, do, I'll live my life the way that you call me to live. You see, because you are... Because what you are is a long-distance Christian instead of an up-close disciple when you're not operating in God's authority, when you're not understanding things. So you get to see all the authority operate when you become and when you're involved in making a disciple. You see, one thing that I absolutely love about discipleship is simply that. Now, you know, I I was talking with Pastor Paul Burt earlier, right? And he got to speak into the students' lives and he was talking about, he goes, man, it's so weird when people call me Pastor Paul. Right, like, and but I, I, I got to stop, and because I've always been a disciple in his life, I got to stop and I go, Paul, hey, every time they call you Paul, remember people are following you. I mean, every time they call you pastor, remember people are following you. So it, it reminds me, hey, I have to live my life in a way that's worth following, right? That replicates Jesus. And so that's the reality of that happens. And so that's what I want to see happen inside of this world. And God goes, hey, this can happen. This is exactly what I have for you. And here's how, it does, here's how he does this. He says, you have to be a disciple to get this. You see, Jesus possesses all authority, but if you have a long-distance relationship, you can't piggyback on the authority. You get the benefits of authority operating in your life when you're an up-close disciple. So he goes, here's discipleship. And he's speaking the message to everybody. And we're there. We're part of this meeting. And he goes, here's the three participles you must follow to make disciples. He says, I want you to go. See, I want you to go. You see, the word go in Matthew chapter 10, he says it like this. He says, go to the lost sheep of the house of Israel and tell, the, tell them the Messiah has came. And so I'm not talking about God just wants you to run aimlessly. That's not what he's wanting you to do. Sometimes, I mean, I love people that are like, hey, tell me what to do. I got it. Let's go. I'm like, I want them around me. But I'm like, hey, I don't want to just run into this aimlessly. I, I want to go in a way that brings my witness. I want to go in a way that's going to be impactful. And so what Jesus is saying, he's saying, I want you to go into all the world. And and then the course talks about the baptizing and teaching. But but the go element is what he's saying is I want you to bring your witness. You see, it means pick up your cross and bear it among the people of this world. Let them see Jesus. They shouldn't have to look any further than you to see what Jesus looks like. Not your pastor, right? Although we, we do live that and we do operate that way. But the reality is, is we're, we're not up here going, hey, just imitate us. No, we're going, hey, imitate Jesus, right? We want you to understand we imitate Jesus and I hope we're doing a great job showing you what it looks like when you imitate Jesus and you be Jesus to a dark world. You show them um, what it looks like. You see, we can't get comfortable in our cookie cutter routines. If we're not careful, we'll will. Man, I'm, I'm a creature of habit, right? Like, I love my routines. I got a routine, I got to do it. I wake up at a certain time, I do the breakfast, I have to get everything ready for all the kids for school. Like, routines are what makes things work. But when it comes to God, I'm like, God, 
Blow up the routine if you need to blow it up. Holy Spirit, have your way. I don't want to just do it my way. I want to do it your way. So if today needs to be different, I'm okay if it's different. Lord, you have control. You see, but when you say Jesus Christ, you see, what I'm talking about here is bringing Jesus Christ everywhere you go. You see, I love this analogy because I, I try to let my students know, and Ethan last time helped me preach this point, and as he was talking about it, he began to explain what it looks like when we say, hey, I'm a follower of Jesus Christ. Because if I say God, then people are like, okay, good. I don't know what God you're talking about. But the minute I said Jesus Christ, even the rocks have to cry out to him, right? Like Jesus has all authority. So when I start saying Jesus Christ, it changes things. So I challenge you students, bring Jesus Christ to your school. Don't just go mere, oh yeah, I serve God. No, say, hey, I serve Jesus, the one true God that can change things, that can make things happen. And he does an amazing thing in my life. That's what I want us to bring. I want us to walk into places and I don't want them to be confused on who we're talking about. No, we're talking about the Messiah. We're talking about Jesus because he is impactful. So if you struggle with witnessing, start witnessing by just telling them about the things Jesus did in your life. Look, that wasn't easy for Macy, but I knew it would be the perfect sermon illustration, right? Because it would have been a lot easier if we were just with the youth group. But now it's like, oh no, I gotta say this in front of parents, adults, everything. But you wanna know what that's gonna do? The more Macy begins to share that, the more she's gonna realize what God's done in her life, the transformation that's come place, and she's now gonna walk in a whole new anointing, right? And so that's the reality. So if you're not sharing your testimony, then you're missing it. God says, go and bring your witness. You see, secondly, he says, teach them. Teach them. You know, and and I, I wanna... I want to talk here because I'm not talking about scholars things. Well, well, Paul, this is going to get boring teaching them, right? Like, but can I be honest with you? You want to know why I fell in love with discipleship? You see, my story at a 17-year-old boy, um, part of my story, I was 15 years old. My dad died in a car wreck. It, it caused me to have this like crossroads in my life, right? Like I didn't know what was going to happen. Um, and through that moment, my sister Renee was in Louisiana. I was in California. I wanted nothing to do with Louisiana. I didn't understand Louisiana, but I also didn't have anything to do with God. I didn't understand God. I go up to Louisiana and I find myself in this place where people go to church every Sunday. I'm like, we don't do that in California. Like, we go to the beach. Like, we work really hard. So, like, I was like, but I was, I was really scratching my head. I'm like, this 16-year-old boy, I'm like, like, everybody goes to church on Sunday? Like, like this is like, and I was up in northern Louisiana, so I might as well have been in Texas. It was Shreveport, Louisiana when I first came there. And so, but it's true. People just, they went to church. And so I went, okay, well, let me see what this is. I went to church, and it got really weird, guys. You know, like, I'll be honest with you, but it was because I had a brother-in-law at the time that was, oh, I'm going to bring Paul to the most um, UPC church, Pentecost. And I'm like, I'm all about it, right? Like, I'm all about it now because I understand the Holy Spirit. But 16-year-old Paul didn't understand the Holy Spirit, didn't understand the operation of it. So I walk into this and I'm like, yeah, yeah, y'all could go to church. I'm not going to church. (laughs) Like, I don't know what that was. I didn't understand it. I felt like the biggest outsider ever, right? Like I did not feel welcomed. I felt like I was like, I, I don't want to ever lose control like that. You know, like it was difficult for me. I had a hard time with it. I'm going, this is not okay. So, so I said, I'm not going to church. But you want to know something my dad did that didn't necessarily serve God? He instilled something inside of me. He said, Paul, if you see somebody that has a need, help meet it. So after losing my dad, I realized... Well, one way that I can always keep my dad inside my life is I'm going to meet needs. So I'm riding my bike around the neighborhood, and I see someone moving in. This is how intentional God is in my life. I stop, and I go, hey, you don't know me. I live around the block. I said, you're moving in. Can I help you move in your house? He goes, yeah, absolutely. His name's David Logan. He says, but I'm not moving everything into my house. We're moving in my garage because i got to sand my cabinets and everything like that. And I'm like, you need help sanding cabinets? Uh, I'm here to help sand cabinets, right? Like this became a very bigger and a longer thing. And so, so then I found myself sanding cabinets and here's what happened. I started to have a relationship with this man. His name was David Logan. Started to ask him what he's doing. He's like, yeah, I'm coming here to start a church. I'm coming here to plant a church. I said, okay, well, what does that mean? Like, how did you just start a church? Like you ain't even got a building, bro. You got a house. <laughs> like, you know, like he goes, I'm going to start it in my house. I said, 
well, how are you going to pay the bills? Well, I'm going to figure that out, Paul, but I'm going to trust God. And he's like, you know, I'm asking these questions that are very, you know, 16-year-old, like, this doesn't make sense, like, in some ways going, you're, you're not making sense. I, I, do you, have you thought this through? Like, you know, like, and he's like, hey, why don't you come to my church? And I said, well, what kind of church is it? <laughs> you know, I'm like, I'm like, whoa, 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 I, I've already experienced some church that I'm not sure of. He goes, hey, we're just going to break down God's word. So I came inside of his house. He began to break down God's word. He began to explain things to me. He began to do that. Long story short, I'm at his church for pretty much a year, and then I start helping in an inner city ministry church where I'm helping these kids, and, you know, I wasn't saved, so they were cussing. I'm like, they're speaking my language, and I got to learn too, so let's do this, right? Like, if I'm just being honest, like, hey, here we go. And so we're doing this kind of thing, and I'm going, I'm learning here, I'm learning there, I'm doing meeting needs. I'm going, I'm learning how to pray. This little kid's learning how to pray. I'm understanding God's word. This little kid's understanding God's word. His kids that he adopted, David and Becky Logan. And it hit me. Here I am. I went, finished high school. And I go, I looked at Pastor David and I said, hey, how do I get this? I, I, don't, I don't know if I want to go to college right now. I want discipleship is what I was asking him. I said, how does this happen? And that's when he introduced me to something called Master's Commission. So as a 17-year-old boy, there was three in Louisiana. I wasn't going to one that said Farmerville, Louisiana. That's how spiritual it was. <laughs> and that's how spiritual I was. I said, no, God, I won't even check that out. The address is Farmerville, Louisiana. The next one was right there in Houghton. It was right by Shreveport. And, I was, and the crazy part was that was the church that I first went to that was the fully <laughs> pinnacle. I was like, I'm not going there. I was like, that's not where I want to be discipled. The other one was in Lafayette, Louisiana. I drove down there, and they had four services at the time. I said, who does four services? Like, this, they just really like church. <laughs> you know, like, so here I am. I, I go down there Saturday night. I watch the first service. I sit in the balcony. And I, I went, man, that was amazing. Then I went the next day. They had three on Sunday. I went to the next one. I said, he just preached the same sermon. Then I went to the next one. I was like, oh, there's nothing different. But I caught something on the fourth one. The fourth one I, I don't, I'm, now I know it's the Holy Spirit. I didn't know it was at the time. But in that moment, as I sat there and the pastor came out and did the altar call one more time, again, with tears in his eyes and weeping, God said, you're home. Yeah. Wow. And so I said, okay, God, you're right. I want to have a heart like that for people. I saw this man cry every time he preached the gospel and every time he did a salvation message. I said, I do want that. So I went up and met him, said, you don't know me. My name is Paul Jacqua. <laughs> I want to come to your school. He introduced me to Sean Marcel. The rest was history. I've been there 17 years now. I now direct the school that I was doing, right? <laughs> I say all that to drive home that second point. Teach them. Invite people to your house and teach them how you read your word. Get involved in a small group here at Central Church. Don't just come on Sunday. How are you going to learn how to really dis break down this word of God by getting with other people and reading it with them? How are you gonna learn to effectively pray? Be around somebody that's got a prayer life, right? That can, all, that can pray on the spot, that can encounter people and can begin to change things because they understand what they're doing when they bind things and, and having to lose them here on earth, right? Like that's how you teach someone. So what I said is, okay, let's teach. Okay, God, so now you say go, you say teach. And then what's the last thing? And I did a little bit, a little bit backwards, right? Because if you read it, it just says baptize them too. And so, but the reality is the last one was baptize them in the name. Baptize them in the name. And he's not talking about dunking them in water. See, water baptism says, hey, I'm a new creation in Christ. That's letting other people know. But what he's saying is baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And so what does it mean to baptize someone in the name? It means that what Jesus is saying, hey, is I want to be in union with you. Right? Like, I want a union, a holy matrimony with you because I want you to understand something. I get it now that I have this beautiful redhead that is by my side and does things with me. And whenever I do something, it affects her. Whenever she does something, it affects me. I get it now. And so what I've realized is that God's saying, hey, I want to be in a union with you because you carry my name. You see, and when you carry my name, you represent me. I want you to represent me well. You see, he's... Your new, uh, your new identification is that you're a Christian. That means your identity to get with God comes with your relationship with Christ. See, Matthew, Matthew um, in chapter 10, Matthew 10, Jesus says this. He says, if you deny me before men, I'll deny you before my, heaven, my Father in heaven. 
But then he says, like, you know, that's harsh if that's, he just leaves it there, right? Like, sometimes people are like, I can quote that. But it's like, no, 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 that's not how he left it. You see, but he said, if you deny me before man, so it's like people are like, oh, Jesus is just going to deny me. That's how people will justify things, right? But if you continue to read, he says, but if you confess me before men, I will for confess you before my father because my father is only going to do what I agree with. What is he saying? I'm only going to agree with the stuff you include me in. If you leave me out, don't be mad that it didn't happen because you did not include me in that decision. And too many times I've been there. I was like, God, I'm sorry. I didn't include you on the front end of that decision. But if we'll include God in that front end, if we'll understand what it means to get with God, get alone with God and grab a hold of the truth that he has, then we'll understand our union with him. And so therefore, I want you to go as a baptized person, a person married to Christ, a person that understands what you're representing. You see, baptize them in the name. Why baptize them in the name? Why, why is it important that we carry Christ? Not because God's looking for everyone to be pastors, because you look at it and go, well, that's a pastor's role, or maybe that's a pastor's job, but God wants all of us to be ministers, right? Because here's what a minister looks like. A minister looks like this. When we carry the name of Jesus, you see, we're, a, we're no longer just a doctor, if that's your profession. You see, you're a doctor, that when, that, um, you're no longer just a doctor, he's God's representative in the medical field. And when you're God's representative in the medical field, it's so that the medical field sees what it looks like when God helps hurting people through you because you carry the name of Jesus. You see, you're, if you're a businessman, you're not just a businessman. You're God's representative in a business. So the business world gets to see what it looks like when God cuts a deal, when God stands there, when it's justified, when it has an uprightness about it, right? You're not just a teacher. No, you're a teacher. You're a representative of God that in a classroom, so the classroom gets to see what it looks like when, te- when God teaches a lesson because you represent him. You might be the only God that that kid ever sees, especially if you're a teacher in a public field, right? Or are you, let's talk about a home taker. So you're not just a home taker. You're not just a housewife. No, you're a house. You're not just a housewife. You're God's representative to the home. So the home gets to see what God looks like when God raises a family because we carry his name. I carry his name. God wants you to carry his name. So the question is, is what kind of relationship do you want? What kind of relationship do you want? Because I'm tired of a relationship that feels like I can do more. I want a relationship that goes, God, I include you in everything. God, I'm, I'm going to walk into everywhere I go. I'm going to have spiritual eyes and I'm going to be looking for the, the need. I'm going to be looking for the moment. I want to invite people. Hey, I love that. Pastor Daryl, how, how incredible that you guys are saying, bring your friends to church. If you don't have a friend, every single one of y'all have a neighbor. They should know that you go to Central Church and they should could be here this Sunday, right? Like, because the reality is, is guys, let's get our friends doing what we're doing because so they can understand what God is doing. And so it's our job. We got to carry that. So the question is, what relationship do you want? You see, the official and the crowd in the stands are in the stadium, but only the players on the field have the authority. And we need, to, we need to operate with the authority Christ has given us. You see, he's no longer walking this earth and saying, hey, I'm going to do it. He's not just modeling it. He lives inside of us. And he gives us the empowerment to walk it out. But he's only going to do that as we get close. And who, I don't know who's on keys, but they can come up here if they're on keys. In closing, what I want you to understand is that I have, a, I have this thing that's inside of me. And I begin to realize something. That God's asking for us to understand his authority. God's asking for us to understand what discipleship looks like. God's saying, hey, can you, can you grab a hold of the truth of who I am and understand that I'm no longer just going, he's not just going to sit back. You see, I don't know if you're, if you just look in our world, man, we need people to rise up. We need a generation. We need people. And it can't be shouldered just by a few. It's got to be shouldered by many. We got to go, hey, we're going to fight for something. We're going to stand for something because the church matters. The church matters. The church is not about just a building or just coming here. The church is about us coming together, gathering together, encouraging one another to be able to go out and even do more things right here in the city of Covington, of Conyers, of greater Atlanta, right? So the reality is, is what I begin to realize is, God, 
I don't need you to be bigger in my life. I need you to appear bigger in areas in my life. And so I read Psalms 34, one through three, and it says it like this. I love how the psalmist says this. It says, I will bless you, bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be on my mouth. There's that word, right? Don't read past it. He said continually. So when things aren't going well, God, I'm gonna stop and praise you. God, when I'm hurting, no, no, you said continually praise you. God, when I'm lost, no, you said continually praise you. God, I'm going to praise you because you're praiseworthy. His praise shall continually be, on, be in my mouth. My soul will make its boast in the Lord. The humble will hear it and rejoice. Oh, magnify the Lord with me and let us exalt his name together. I'm gonna stop there again because he said, oh, magnify. Man, I love whenever there's something in the Bible and I'm like, God, thank you for helping me understand something. Thank you for grabbing a hold of my heart and showing me something because he says, magnify the Lord with me. Now, you know what magnification is, right? I think we all know what magnification is. It's to make something bigger, right? It makes something bigger. Now, you can't make God any bigger than he already is. In fact, this morning for a Bible study with my students, we're going through the characteristics of God. And I said, hey, I want you to read the characteristics of God. And they started reading about omni omniscient, omnipresent, uh, omnipotent, right? Like it began to start really breaking all those things down. They're like, he's everywhere. Like God is in the midst of everything. And you know, like, and so they're starting to get some revelation. I'm like, this is incredible, right? Because the reality is, is God is exactly who God is. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. God didn't change, who changed? Me, I changed. You see, there's somewhere along the way, I didn't keep God the center of what it needed to be. I didn't make God bigger than what, than what it needed to be. So what I need to do is do what the psalmist said and say, oh God, I want to magnify you in every area of my life. You have control of my finances. You're bigger than any mountain that's in front of me. God, you are bigger than any disease that sits there. God, you are bigger than the, than the reality that I feel like this person for some reason won't come to a saving knowledge of who Jesus is. But Jesus is in this room tonight. And he's saying, I have something for you. So if you're here and you don't know who God is, God's going, oh, I'm about to be bigger in your life. Oh, you're about to make me bigger in your life. And God wants to be bigger in your life because he sees you. He notices you. He knows exactly what's, what's going on inside of your thought patterns. He knows every hair on your head. He understands your DNA and how you were made. And he wants to do something. And so with every head bowed and every eye closed in this room, I want to do something. I want to ask, is there somebody in here that that's, you would be honest and you'd say, Paul, what you're saying is me. You see, I need to make big, God bigger in my life because it's not about just being an up close disciple. It's about just getting in. It's about get, making God Lord of my life. If that's you, he wants to do that for you tonight. He has something for you. And so I want to ask that you would just make Jesus that in your life. And so on the count of three, I just want you to raise your hand. I'm not gonna embarrass you. I just want you to acknowledge, God, I need you. And when you do that, God's gonna do something inside of your life. You're gonna begin to feel something and I'm gonna lead you in a prayer. And so, God, so on one, don't miss this opportunity. You don't know if you'll ever get this again. God forbid, but anyone can be snatched into eternity, right? And God's going, tonight I had a plan for you. It's not by chance that you're here. Two, God sees you, God loves you. God wants to do something in your life. Three, I see hands already going up all over this room. I see your hand, I see your hand. Yes, I see your hand. Well, here's what I wanna do. I wanna lead you in a prayer. And everyone in this room, and with your head bowed, and eye, head bowed, eye closed, just for their sake, I'm gonna lead you in this prayer. And here's what I want you to understand. Everyone in this room is gonna say it out loud along with you. Because at one time or not, Paul Jock was exactly where you were. I sat in those seats and I felt my heart beating out of my chest and I go, God, I better respond. God, I need to make you bigger in my life. And so everyone, I want everyone to repeat after me this prayer and I want it to come straight from your Say, Lord Jesus, for too long I've kept you out of my life and I know that I'm a sinner and that I cannot save myself. No longer will I close the door when I hear you knocking. By faith, I greatly receive your gift of salvation. I'm ready to trust you 
as my Lord and Savior. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for coming to earth. I believe you are the Son of God who died on the cross for my sins and rose from the dead. On the third day, thank you for bearing my sins and giving me eternal life. I believe your words are true. Come into my heart, Lord Jesus, and be my savior. Amen and amen. Come on, church, can y'all give him a big round of applause? Amen, amen. Well, here's what I wanted to do. I asked Pastor Armand earlier, Pastor um, Daryl, so if it needs to move on, you can let move on. Um, but what I asked him earlier is I said, hey, I wanna spend a little bit of time um, in worship if we can do worship again. I'm not sure if it's possible. Um, if not, I'll just pray for you. But, but, I, but I, I realized something. I'm gonna ask my team to come forward. They're gonna come up across the altars right here and anyone that's, I guess, on the prayer team here as well because um, there's only eight of them and I believe God wants, to, wants people to respond. And so I wanna have a response to God. And you wanna know what that response is? I want you to look in your area of your life and go, God, I need to make you bigger in this area. God, I, I, I've let worry grab a hold of me where there should have been faith. God, I've, I've walked through things, God, or I'm walking through something that I need you to do something and I believe tonight my miracle can happen. And God wants to meet you right here at these altars. See, an altar is a special place. I told my students, hey, don't, don't, you, don't you mess this up. Why? But what was I saying? I was saying, hey, please be prayed up. Please understand that people are gonna come here and they're wanting to see something change in their life. They need Jesus more than they've ever needed him, maybe in this moment. I don't know what it is. Maybe they're just coming up because they need to be challenged in their faith. But I want you to, if that's you and you're going, hey, I need to make God bigger in my life, then I want you to not hesitate. Get out of your seats and come find one of our students up here to pray with you as we worship.